Welcome everybody to this uh, event on uh, UK measures of national well-being uh, at the Royal Statistical Society. I'm really delighted to uh, have so many of you here tonight for this uh, debate. Uh, I'm also personally really interested in this topic and so very pleased I was asked to chair the event. Uh, a decade ago in 2004 I co-wrote uh, a pamphlet or report for the New Economics Foundation think tank called A Wellbeing Manifesto uh, and the ideas we had in that about using wellbeing uh, research to influence public policy is something that uh, has had legs ever since and uh, just a couple of weeks ago a new report called Wellbeing and Policy was published by something called the Legatum Institute. It had uh, some uh, big names attached to it, Lord Gus O'Donnell, uh, Lord Richard Layard and others. Um, and so there are, there are clearly lots of useful ideas and contested debates in this space which I think are really important. The kind of research that's playing out in the wellbeing field, some of you will be very familiar with it, argues that uh, you know, uh, it, it sort of takes a look at the importance of income uh, and economic growth and asks questions around uh, how far that feeds into wellbeing and happiness uh, and also points to the fact that our, our relationships with other people, uh, the quality of our work, uh, all of these sorts of things feed into well-being uh, and are very important factors which can sometimes be overlooked in public policy making. So uh, these are the sorts of ideas floating around. Uh, another recent report by the Fabian Society recently was asking for alternative economic measures uh, rather than uh, the much criticised uh, GDP. Poor GDP always gets it in the neck. Um, be useful to debate whether it actually ha does have merits uh, uh, as a measure of progress, but uh, the Fabian Society was calling for median household incomes, uh, the greener economy, labour productivity, to be alternative uh, economic measures of progress for us as a society. So uh, these are the kinds of uh, topics on our plate tonight, and I'm delighted to have two uh, really good speakers to get us into the issues, but uh, I know uh, from having read the participant list there's a lot of expertise in the room tonight, and so I'm really keen as chair to have a big Q&A uh, and a lot of discussion because there's a lot of expertise on the floor as well. So, But to introduce our speakers, we've got Glenn Everett, who's uh, Director for Measuring National Wellbeing Programme at the ONS, uh, and he's going to kick off for about 20 minutes and give an overview of what the Office for National Statistics has been doing in this area. Some really innovative, uh, I think, world-leading work uh, in this space. And then a response from Penny Young, who's the Chief Exec at NatSan Social Research, one of the leading social research agencies in the UK, uh, and formerly head of all audiences uh, at the BBC and Head of Research at, uh, at which, so uh, some uh, two really useful perspectives I think. But as I say, we'll then open it up to Q&A and we'll definitely be out of here by half past six, uh, if not earlier, it depends how, how long you can sustain yourselves with debates and questions and answers. And I suppose in terms of the kinds of discussion we might have, I mean as well as debating whether the ONS measures are the right ones, the kind of technical side of the, the measures debate. I hope we'll ask some broader questions about uh, the efficacy of such measures for policy purposes. Uh, are these the worthwhile measures to put our investments in as we can see cutbacks happening in other parts of the statistical system? So there are, in a sense, the political economy of uh, statistics to be discussed, as well as taking a step back, some of the more philosophical questions about, well, what is well-being and how do we measure it anyway? Uh, so I do hope uh, you'll get involved in all of these things and not see it just as a sort of dry statistical debate to, to be had. Great. Well, that's enough from me as chair. I'm going to now uh, hand over to to Glenn to, to kick us off. Thanks very much. I've put up the title of the story so far, largely because this is work in progress and quite happy to have discussions about what we're doing, how we're doing it. A lot of the information we're putting out at this stage is still fairly experimental, but we want it used. We also want your feedback. So, you know, any comments, quite useful to go forward. Today, I just want to go through pretty much the background of the program, what we've been doing, how we're doing it. Our actual approach to measuring national well-being, we call it measuring national well-being, but you might hear it in other terms of well-being, quality of life, progress. These sorts of terms are used internationally and nationally at different times. Um, but in particular, I want to now start to think about its uses. I use this term basically use it or lose it. If it's not being used appropriately, whether in policy or the general public, do we, should we be doing this? And outline future plans. This is, as I said, the story so far. We want to continue, we want to make this work. Bit more of the background. 
Traditional measures of progress, such as GDP, are increasingly considered an incomplete picture of the state of the nation. This is recorded in things like the Stiglitz Report, like the, even the SNA, the, the system of national accounts actually highlights that GDP isn't a great measure of social well-being. But we're looking to provide additional economic, social and environmental measures alongside GDP to provide a complete picture of how society is doing. And back in November 2010, the UK's Measuring National Wellbeing Program was launched by the Prime Minister David Cameron and the Nat National Statistician. At the time, David Cameron, I often refer to him as the then Prime Minister, and I've got to stop doing that because I, it tends to preempt things, but uh, I'll be a bit careful. David Cameron, back in November 2010, you've got to take practical steps to make sure government is properly focused on our quality of life as well as economic growth. And this information will help government work out with evidence the best ways of helping to improve people's well-being. And in response, Jill Matheson, the national statistician, noted that statistics are the bedrock of democracy. In a country where we care about what's happening, we must measure what matters, the key elements of national well-being. We want to develop measures based on what people tell us matters most. This is not that new a concept. Robert Kennedy, back in 1968, noted that the gross national product counts air pollution and cigarette advertising and ambulances to clear our highways of carnage. It counts napalm and the cost of a nuclear warhead and armoured cars for police who fight riots in our streets. But it does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of their education or the joy of their play. It measures everything except that which makes life worthwhile. So it's not that new a concept. The Stiglitz Report, published in 2008, was very much a, a catalyst for providing new emphasis going forward. Uh, so how did we take this work forward? Well, to start with, we asked what matters to you. So we held a national debate back in November 10 from, for about six months. And the aim was to gain basis and public support for methods of measuring national well-being. We held some 175 events attended by 7,000 plus people. We generated some 34,000 responses. We employed both conventional and innovative methods of communicating. As an office, it was about the first time we started to use things like Twitter and blogs to actually engage people of all ages and all uh, parts. And that debate has helped the ONS identify the key areas that matter most and it helps to ensure that the actual measures we use will be relevant not only to the government, but also to the wider public. We needed a framework for measuring all this. And what we developed was very much based on an individual's well-being, the factors directly affecting their well-being, such as their health, their relationships, personal finance, what they do, where we live, education, and more contextual domains such as the economy, the environment and the governance. But it also has additional dimensions such as equity or equality and the sustainability issues over time. So with that approach we, we moved into using many existing resources or sources, around 20 to populate the domains. We added four questions on personal well-being to household surveys, the, the existing surveys majoring on the annual population survey. The four questions covered life satisfaction, how worthwhile people's life were, how happy they were or anxious they were yesterday. And these findings are analysed alongside other information to help understand the impact on well-being. And what are we trying to achieve with all this is basically an accepted and trusted set of national statistics to help people understand and monitor national well-being. It's based on three pillars, the economy, social and environment, known as the triple bottom line. But before you get death by PowerPoint, I was going to ask a few questions. This isn't just about subjective or personal well-being. But did people know what percentage of respondents rated their life satisfaction as high or medium? That's 7 to 10 on our 0 to 10 scale in 2012-13. Just a quick show of hands. Anyone? 66%? Oh, there's always one. 
Who cheated? <laughs> yes, it's 77%. Yeah. I took part. <laughs> Good. I've got a couple more. What percentage of total energy consumption was from renewable sources in 2011? 4.1%? Oh, there's people from... Oh, yeah. <laughs> Ruins all my fun. OK. Um, again, 4.1%. But that is six and a half times what it was in 1990. So the huge increase, but we're still a very small percentage. Again, this is all part of the program, taking forward this work. And what was the value of informal childcare as a percentage of GDP in 2010? 2%? Any takers? 6.6? 9.1? Twenty-three. A fairly well-informed audience, but uh, yeah. Last one, just to keep moving. And what's the value of human capital in 2012? 80, 817 billion, 8.2 trillion, 17.9 trillion, 81.7 trillion. And how many noughts in trillion? Yeah. So, okay, the just 17.9 trillion was the value of human capital. But again, the sort of changing measures of this is to trying to help us a better understanding of society. So I'll move on to actually our four questions that we've brought into the uh, surveys. These are the, the first ones, overall, how satisfied are you with your life nowadays? This is an evaluation or evaluative question. The second was, Overall, to what extent do you feel the things you do in your life are worthwhile? This is very much trying to reflect on the eudaimonia or feeling of people's issues. And then looking at affect or experience, having a positive or negative question. The first being, overall, how happy do you feel, did you feel yesterday? The other was, overall, how anxious did you feel yesterday? And all of these were answered 0 to 10 scale, where 0 is not at all and 10 is completely. But it's worth remembering when you're looking at anxiety, the lower the score might be the better result. These overall changes that I mentioned were 77% for satisfied. These are the results from 2011-12 and 2012-13. These are our first two data points with these questions. The worthwhile was 81% said seven or more, which was up 0.7 from the previous year. How happy did you feel yesterday? 72% up slightly, 0.5 from the previous year. And again, anxious, saying six or more out of 10, which was 21%, but that's actually down, which is a, an improvement. Um, I should stress, we're very keen with the program to stress distributions. Uh, I often say mean is meaningless. With some of these, if we say it's 7.2 or 7.4, what does it mean? But looking at the proportions in different bands is probably more important for policy focus. For example, if we look at the 0 to fours, the so-called miserable minority, it's probably better to sort of target some scarce resources in those sorts of areas. Uh, what is important to subjective well-being? Our latest findings from, we did a regression analysis back in May, and found the most important things for a pe person's personal well-being is their self-reported health, their employment status, particularly if they're unemployed, and their relationship status, particularly if they're divorced or widowed. These are the most important aspects of subjective well-being. Interesting uh, other findings were that the higher earnings don't necessarily lead to higher feelings of happiness, but they do increase people's life satisfaction. And people in higher occupations or higher qualifications tend to be more anxious than lower occupations or qualifications. And the other finding that we found was choice was important. People actually working a job that they're content with have higher life satisfaction than those wanting an additional or different job. If you're working part-time, want to work full-time. If you're a full-time carer but want to work, these sorts of choice are quite important to the impact they have on their well-being. We broke some of this up, as I said earlier, into the economy, environment, and social areas. And on the economy side, just as a whistle-stop tour of some of the developments we're looking at as part of this program, it is focusing on the household perspective, the income and expenditure of the household, developing human capital estimates. We've now working on regionalising some of these because of some of the policy departments devolved administrations wanting that sort of information to help their policy planning. Today we published, for the first time, economic well-being. This is seven additional measures that we expect to supplement or complement GDP to actually help people understand what's going on in the economy. These are adjusted measures for things like um, uh, the, the 
terms of trade, where you start to look at the price differentials between countries, uh, remittances being transferred to and from different countries, and overseas ownerships, you know, where the actual money finishes, netting all these off to actually get a better understanding of the UK's position. It also does some adjustments for things like government services in kind, where we actually have estimates to consider things like the health and education received. And these are sort of very helpful if you're doing sort of more international comparisons to put things on a comparable basis. We're developing household satellite accounts, and these are the seven accounts that we're developing. We've done estimates of childcare, adult care, and volunteering. We're work in progress on transport, housing, laundry and cooking. So I'd hope by next year we'll have completed the full set of household satellite accounts and we'll be looking for some feedback to see how often we update these estimates. On the environment side, we're still taking forward the environmental accounts which are come under the program, but they're being further developed with things like the environmental goods and services, environmental, environmental protection expenditure, and at the end of this month, we'll produce, I hope on the 30th, he says hopefully, um, the natural capital estimates. This is a sort of top-down estimate. But while we're doing that, we're developing bottom-up estimates. Uh, and we've published a roadmap to 2020 to develop the set of these estimates in detail where we're picking up the habitats and the cross-cutting areas like land use, carbon, water, soil, and the specific habitats where we've started to put some estimates out in the public domain on woodlands, and we're developing estimates on the wetlands, grasslands, mountains, moorlands and heath, and enclosed farmlands, marine and coastal margins. You may have seen the wellbeing wheel. Uh, it's not very easy to see at this stage. But the idea was to actually publish all this information in a single place that was fairly engaging but non-hierarchical. We, we're not trying to weight any of these and we're not trying to add them all together to get some sort of composite index. But if you want to look at our website to see this, again, we've got an interactive wheel which looks something along, those, along the lines like this, where you can kick, click on relevant domains to see the information, pop-up time series on the various domains to actually look through. As this is developed, we hope over time to develop the different dimensions, uh, whether it's subgroups such as children and young people, which we published in March, I think. Where are we? April, yes. It wasn't that long ago, sorry. Um, where we're looking at the same sort of domains, but reflecting children and as a separate set, young people. Again, triggered by uh, policy engagement and desire to have more information in these areas. But go and play. Yeah, it's, it's, it's basically to engage and people to see the information. But I said earlier about use it or lose it. The important part is policy appraisal and policy use. It's important these new measures are not just published but become part of public debate and are used to improve the development, implementation and evaluation of policies. Back in July 2011, the Treasury and Department of Work and Pensions updated the Green Book to include an approach that uses subjective wellbeing measurement to improve social cost-benefit analysis. Social cost-benefit analysis seeks to express the full social costs and full social benefits of policy in monetary terms. It's the language of Treasury. You put a pound sign on it, they'll listen. So these estimates can inform options, analysis and business cases. This is still early days, but I've got some examples of how this wellbeing data is already being used. The Department of Health has an alcohol strategy against a consideration of national wellbeing. We have the Department of Health uh, sort of looking at uh, health and wellbeing areas now. The Civil Service People Survey, uh, looking at insights into staff wellbeing to help steer our HR policies. DWP is assessing the impact on wellbeing of the very long term unemployed, doing a sort of before and after test. Cabinet Office is evaluated the impact of National Citizen Service on the well-being of participants. And a more recent one that I learnt, Barclay Homes is using well-being as part of their evaluation for planning purposes. They use a wheel themselves and use our, as in the ONS's uh, survey questions, which we make publicly available, and benchmark them against the, the national or local results to see how their recent development works when they survey their local community. I'm sure it's to help them with their planning approvals. But, uh, if people wanted to see a lot of detail, there was an environmental audit committee report 
which has full detail of the government responses, which details department by department their plans to develop and use wellbeing information. Internationally, this isn't just the UK. Uh, the Stiglitz report seemed to be a catalyst across the world to actually take forward a lot of this work. Eurostat and the OECD are developing measures of wellbeing. Uh, some of the key international developments include the report of the Commission on the Measurement of Economic Performance and Social Progress, the so-called Stiglitz Report back in 2009. In 2011, the OECD's Better Life Initiative was launched, an online interactive instrument that allows users to measure wellbeing across countries. They use, uh, you can put in your own weights. One of the things we've avoided is trying to weight all these measures, but put in their own to actually see how influential the diff different domains are. The How's Life report provides more in-depth analysis and there was the adoption of the recommendations of the NC Eurostat sponsor, sponsorship group on measuring progress, well-being and sustainable development by the ESSC in November 2011. Other countries are taking this forward as well. You could look at the ABS's, the Australian Bureau of Statistics measures of Australia's progress, so-called MAP. Uh, the Canadian Doing Index of Wellbeing, the State of the USA website are all available. Other countries also are taking this forward. There's been a lot of interest in Germany, the Italians, the French. It's quite uh, a worldwide interest on this. New Zealand as well. So what's next? We're going to encourage the use of wellbeing data and policy to make sure it's used. We're going to keep continuing to review and refine the domains and measures of wellbeing, including an assessment of change. We're yet to put you know, the so-called answer the so what question to say what does all this mean? What's the overall effect? How is it changing? So we're working on that. We'll re continue to do further research on drivers of wellbeing. In June we expect to do more on local area analysis as well as a regression analysis including income. We'll review the framework for presenting wellbeing data to cover sustainability in particular, equity and some perhaps subnational information. This is sort of looking at the different subgroups that you can divide this by, whether it's children, young people, older people, or perhaps doing something more locally by different regions. The sustainability, we're recently, as ONS, are going to take over from DEFRA, the Sustainable Development Indicators, and there's a worldwide development called Post-2015 on Sustainable Development Goals that will be implemented in 2016. And we're looking to implement this as a sort of complete framework to show overall how the countries are doing. We will continue to develop the subjective wellbeing question and other indicators, for example, human, social and natural capitals, and the non-market production. And the UK will continue to input in international developments with, for example, the UN, the OECD and the European Union. And we'll continue to pro consult widely. A lot of this, we've put information out and it's great to get it, any feedback. But some of the key messages I want to leave you with, this is a long-term development project. We're still learning, and some of the outputs are still experimental. It's not a happiness index. It's one of the battles we've had with some of the press, trying to get a feature of the whole wellbeing information. But we want people to consider the importance of distributions, not just averages. And there's not a single measure. It's very complex, it's multidimensional, and we think you need both the objective and subjective data to actually assess how the country's doing. And it's not a replacement for GDP. It's supplementing rather than supplanting or complementing GDP. And its use is, one of the uses we expect is for better targeting of scarce resources. And I like to quote OECD's better policies for better lives. It just seems to sum it up quite nicely. And if you want to look at more, if you look at the ONS website, forward slash wellbeing with a hyphen, I always use a hyphen. You can have it either way, but I like the hyphen. And my last thing is, it's to be continued. We're making sure this information, we expect it to continue and hope it continues. I'm going to pass back to Heaton or Penny. <laughs> Thank you.
Thanks, Glenn. Um, I realise that I've unthinkingly not used hyphens whenever I talk about well-being, so there you go. I've definitely learnt something. <laughs> Good, excellent. Um, so, first of all, thanks very much to Glenn for such an in interesting and clear presentation, and I think the turnout tonight shows really what tremendous interest there is in this whole subject. I think really Glenn's case for the ONS program of work can be summarised as, first of all, that the government has a role in advancing the nation's well-being and that the current measure of GDP doesn't do that justice, that it fails to capture many of the important aspects of well-being, so that's one component. Secondly, I think you're making the case that the, um, the ONS's programme of work on well-being advances both the measurement of well-being and also our understanding of it. And thirdly, that it's going to be useful. It's going to be useful to policymakers, to practitioners, to ac academics, to the research community, and of course that it will ultimately have an impact on the lives of the public, so the, the, the better policies um, for better lives thought. So as a discussant, I really just want to probe some of these assumptions briefly and also consider our own role in them as a statistical and research community. So I think the first point is probably the easiest to deal with. I think, I think there's no doubt that GDP fails to capture some of the things that are really important in our, in, in, in our ability to lead rich and fulfilling lives. We can probably take that as red, but just to recap some of the reasons for that, it, it certainly, GDP certainly doesn't capture all useful activity, and childcare is a, is a fantastic example of that, the sheer kind of amount that goes on and the monetized value of that. It certainly doesn't capture what we all value in life, so social relationships in, in particular. And it doesn't take into account the negative impact of um, some economic activity. So it's not taking, fully taking into account negative externalities or use of limited resources, etc. So I think as a research community, and certainly for me personally, I really welcome this whole program of work that, that's really trying to grapple with and use the well-being um, concept uh, more fully to measure it and in policy making. Um, so I take that as red. So, so my first point really is going to be just a quick look at how, how good is the work itself. The first thing I want to say is I really think ONS should be congratulated on the scientific way in which this endeavour has been approached in terms of the whole programme. Um, as Glenn mentioned, first of all, there's been a very wide consultation about what the measures um, should be included. It's been advised by uh, really expert advisory groups, both um, in terms of people who will be using it and also in terms of the technical experts that have been involved. There's been a lot of experimentation, particularly with the subjective well-being questions. There's been cognitive testing and so on. So I think it's a really kind of robust scientific process that's gone into it. So, and I'm really going to be, I should have said really, I'm really going to be focusing mainly on the sub subjective well-being questions as, as more my area of expertise. So there's been a good process. What does the result look like? Do, do the subjective well-being questions look valid? Well, I think certainly in terms of face validity, it looks good. If you're talking about happiness, if you're talking about anxiety, does your work, how satisfied are you with your life? Does life feel worthwhile? That feels good on face validity. It's the sorts of things that we might talk about ourselves. So it certainly seems to be at face value capturing the sorts of things we'd be wanting to look at. But obviously we can look at validity in a number of ways. And I think probably I was thinking about it, for me, one of the most important things is predictive validity. Do measures of well-being actually predict something of use? Um, and I wanted to mention a couple of examples that we've been involved in at NatSense Social Research that shows that, yes, subjective well-being does have really useful predictive validity. So, for example, one of, the, one of our big studies is the English Longitudinal Study of Aging, always a really difficult thing to say, otherwise known as ELSA. And um, UCL led some analysis with our input, which shows that if you basically take two people and you control for everything else and you look at one who's got higher well-being than the other and you revisit people six years on, then as I say, all other things being equal, you will find that the person with higher well-being actually has things like faster walking speed, less likely to have ca cardiovascular disease or a dis disability, and that actually higher well-being levels, um, uh, or rather lower levels of well-being actually predicts higher rates of, of mortality. So there are ways in which subjective well-being really does have hard, concrete outcomes. Another project you mentioned, Glenn, the... Ooh, 
Sorry, have I been doing that the whole way along? Sorry, I'm <laughs> pressing on the thing. I'll try not to. Got my notes here. Um, so back to Glenn's slides. Um, Glenn mentioned some work that DWP is doing, and we've been doing a really interesting study there as well, that if, you, again, if you control for other factors, you find that people with higher levels of well-being get back to work more promptly, more quickly. So there are many ways in which it does look like subjective well-being is, is really useful in terms of its predictive value. I think, furthermore, it's really good that this sort of multidimensional nature of the work, not just the whole triple bottom line thought, but if you're looking at subjective well-being, the fact that there are four factors that are being looked at. And certainly, we're going to be publishing some work that I can't, can't mention in detail today, but has been looking in more detail at the connectedness or otherwise of the, four, of the four factors, and finds that if you do some latent class analysis and effectively cluster people, you find that some of the variables do seem to operate uh, up to a point independently, so there's a cluster of people for example, who feel that their life is worthwhile, um, they score highly on life satisfaction levels, but they show quite higher than average levels of anxiety, so not all four factors correlate in the same way. I think for me, my key point of, of critique that I'd like to see in terms of the, the, the measures themselves improved, um, or just to sort of think about what we actually do about it, is the thorny subject of time period. Obviously, two of the measures do look at, at overall how people feel in terms of their life satisfaction and how worthwhile they feel life is. But obviously, if, if we're just asking about yesterday in terms of anxiety and happiness, that's inevitably going to limit the explanatory power of, of the data. It's good in aggregate. It's great for population estimates. It's good for subgroup estimates. Um, but it doesn't, if we, if we, if it's, it's not sufficient to understand what's going on at the individual level, and hence I think it inevitably does reduce the explanatory power. Um, and I appreciate it's difficult on surveys when you've got a limited number of questions, but obviously if you take something like the Warwick-Edinburgh mental well-being scale, it takes a, something of a longer period. It sort of invites people to think certainly about a couple of weeks, so it's still um, limited in that way, but asks questions such as, I've been dealing with problems well, um, whether people feel loved or not, whether they're showing interest in other people, so some, some really good questions and does a five-point scale from none of the time through to all of the time. And that really does increase the explanatory, explanatory power of subjective well-being. So, but overall, I think in terms of how good is the work, fantastic. Perhaps a harder question, how useful is the work? And I accept Glenn's point that we're on a, on a journey here. Um, there's absolutely no doubt that the work that ONS are doing and the work that other people are doing using subjective well-being is coming up with some incredibly interesting findings. Um, that, you know, for example, work that ONS has done it has found the a positive correlation between earnings and life satisfaction, but a much less strong correlation between earnings and happiness, which is interesting. I don't know whether some of you saw Mark Easton's blog a couple of weeks ago. I think it was coming out of the um, after Gus O'Donnell's work with the Legatum Institute. Um, and basically, he did a blog on the work that had taken round about 274 job types and looked in detail at each job type's life satisfaction and definitely done that trick, trick simply of, um, of ranking. All things are always reduced to, to rankings, aren't they, to league tables. Um, Setting aside the fact that it had got rather ludicrous number, numbers of decimal places, down to three decimal places, unless, Glenn, you can tell me the points. Can you tell me what point zero zero one on life satisfaction the Treasury would monetize at? There probably is a figure somewhere. <laughs> but um, setting aside that, it did show some really interesting things. Vickers, in a league of their own, topped the league and were just really completely disconnected with the rest. Um, really, really happy, but not perfect, so God isn't entirely working, although he's doing a pretty good job, obviously. Um, uh, personally, I hope I'm not going to offend anybody here with your relatives, but I did find a kind of moment of schadenfreude to seem that debt collectors were third from bottom. That certainly gave me a bit of uh, satisfaction. Um, obviously, there are all sorts of imperfections with the way jobs have been clustered, um, but social scientists, which I'd probably consider myself to be one. We did pretty well, 39th out of 274, slightly ahead of statisticians who were lumped with economists at 64th. So anyway, make of that what you will. Really, I'm just classifying, if you're, if you're wanting to look at things that are useful, uh, first point is, uh, is that I'm saying there are definitely some interesting findings. And certainly some slightly more serious work that we've been doing at NatSen on different projects is also um, finding some fascinating findings. So one of the things we've been doing is a lot of secondary analysis on different studies that Sally McManus and colleagues, and also um, in conjunction with the Department of Health for whom the work was being done, analysing different studies to look at 
subjective well-being across the life course and seeing what seemed to be driving it. And there's some really good findings. For example, amongst secondary school aged um, children, and just to quote well, young people, I should say, and just to quote a really interesting finding, whether parents were disabled, in ill health, or a lone parent was not relevant for young people's well-being once other factors were controlled for. So bear in mind that includes lone parents. What mattered more were things such as feeling supported and sharing meals together as a family, which I'll come back to. I think that's a really interesting finding. But obviously to be useful, it's not enough just for findings to be interesting. We need a number of other things. Um, and I think as a research community, and, and Glenn has sort of alluded to this, one of the things that we really need to do is to focus on understanding causality. Um, often, of course, longitudinal data will be particularly important here, but I think really trying to unpick causal pathways. And again, just to quote a really interesting finding from, from Nat Sen, I, I, I'm pretty, right, I think I'm right in saying that it's, back, it's the last adult psychiatric morbidity survey and some follow-up work of that. It's long been known that people in fuel poverty um, have a number of outcomes that aren't great, and they also have um, lower levels of well-being. Um, and one of the things that you see in people in, in fuel poverty is that they have high le higher levels of loneliness. And the causal pathway here is to do with um, feeling embarrassed about bringing people back to your home because your home is cold. I think those sorts of really kind of getting to what's actually going on and understanding the differences, because you were talking a lot then quite rightly about understanding distributions. As a research community, I think really trying to unpick those causal pathways is incredibly important. Secondly, um, I'm slightly sceptical at the moment about the extent to which the policy community have hardwired in um, well-being. I mean, yes, I think on individual policy issues, and particularly where it's relevant, it's definitely being used because it's one of the outcomes that it's either, an, in some cases, it's an outcome, in other cases, it's, it's an obvious driver, and so policymakers do pay attention to it. But again, I just quote Mark Easton. In, the, in his blog on, on well-being recently, he noticed and he did a search on all the Treasury documents that there wasn't a single mention of well-being um, in the Chancellor's speech or in all the Treasury documents that were actually associated with it. And those are kind of the hard tests, in a sense, about at a high level, actually, is it, is it having very much um, impact yet? I do accept it's a long game and that we can't blame, blame ONS for that. <laughs> Um, and I think thirdly, as we understand more and really think about usefulness, it does raise questions. It raises more questions somehow for a society than somehow GDP does about what the role of government actually is, because in some ways you're back to first principles. What is the state for? What are the limits of government? What, what, you know, what is the responsibility of individuals and families and what's the role of the state? So again, I take you back to one of the sort of most fascinating, quite, kind of quite heartbreaking findings really um, in terms of drivers of well-being amongst, amongst youngest children. And we find that one of the strong predictors of, of well-being and happiness is whether kids are um, they're more likely to be happy if they're not shouted at, and they're more likely to be happy if they say they're having fun with their family members at the weekend. Um, so it's a really good example of thinking, okay, so let's, I mean, I think there are examples, but what is the role of the state in relation to that very um, clear driver of well-being when it's something that's happening within the family? Um, Glenn mentioned the Legatum Institute's Commission on Wellbeing and Policy, which is chaired by Gus O'Donnell, which reported, a, 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 a definitely commend it, worth reading, good report a couple of weeks ago. And they've argued for a number of ways in which um, policy is relevant, um, including to questions such as this. And for example, on these, I've picked out things like um, that they argue for the role of school in, and I just thought it was quite brave in a way, talking about character building um, and resilience um, and the funding of parenting classes. So, but again, you, you sort of are getting into, you know, what do you think the role of the state is? Where, where are the limits? Um, so just to conclude, to advance the agenda further, uh, the whole wellbeing agenda, I would suggest the following. I think ONS has got a really powerful role, actually, in nudging people and pushing them um, on their own surveys, whether it's in the public sector or the commercial sector, to include the questions, the four questions on subjective well-being. So whether or not they form part of national statistics, I think the more we can get these questions on surveys, the better. I think it would be great to be grappling a bit more with the um, whether it's enough just to ask about anxiety and happiness yesterday or whether we could also do something about those over a longer period of time. Um, as a research community, I think we, we could invite ourselves to have a relentless focus on causal pathways, um, especially involving longitudinal studies. 
as a policy community, it would be great to see the policy community embedding the work more fully um, at a high level in terms of things like the budget. And you know, we've got a, a probably another really critical general election coming up, and it would be great to see more mention of well-being in politics and the whole agenda, um, including in the party manifestos. And finally, just a sort of thought for, for everybody in this room, I don't know whether you know, but on the NHS Choices website, you can actually complete the Warwick Edinburgh Mental Wellbeing um, uh, Index, and um, it will tell you where you fit against the average and give you some tips on what you can do to improve your wellbeing. I did it earlier today. Um, I'm only average. I'm in the <laughs> average. So and when you go home tonight, it takes you about three minutes, and I think it really gets quite helpful to immerse yourself in the, in the different components of wellbeing and uh, really connects us to this whole agenda. As, as a research community. So thank you very much.